From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. Is all farmed fish bad? And is wild caught as good as it sounds? This is episode 484, and our guest today is Ty Walker. Ty is the owner of Smoke and Chimneys, a revitalized 1930s trout hatchery in southwestern Virginia. There, he raises trout for table fare, sending it to restaurants and retailers around the mid-Atlantic region. Today, Ty exposes big fish, the fish industry that is not unlike big ag, both of which are more concerned with profit than our health. Ty discusses why most farmed fish is indeed problematic and why even wild caught is less than ideal. He goes into detail about the problems with industrial scale wild fishing, why fillets are often pushed on the consumer rather than the whole fish, the problem of overfishing and the lack of regulations on the word fresh and a host of other issues. The bottom line is he shows us that we have alternatives between farmed fish and wild caught. There is a sustainable aquaculture movement afoot, and Ty clues us in about it. Before we get into the conversation, are you curious about the safety of raw milk? Do you wonder about its availability? Go to our website, realmilk.com, for reliable information on real raw milk. There are articles, blog posts, videos, and podcasts that explain why raw milk is healthy, its amazing benefits, and where you can obtain it in the United States. You'll also find insights on the politics and economics of raw milk and industrial milk. So go to realmilk.com, a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation. This is Hilda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Ty. Hilda, thanks for having me. Listen, I thought all farmed fish was bad. Talk to me and try to convince me otherwise. Okay. First, I want to agree with you. Most fish farms are terrible. But then if I asked you, are all pork farms created equal? What would you say? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. Well, there's a huge difference between a confined animal feeding operation and one in which the pigs can live according to their pigness, you know, and they're kind of routing around with their snouts and, you know, really living up to their full potential there, enjoying the sunshine and the care of a place where they're raised sustainably. Okay, then I would ask, Do you think that same paradigm can apply to fish farms? It had never crossed my mind that it could. Yeah, totally. I'm not interviewing you. I'm just trying to lay a little bit of groundwork here. It's really interesting that if you saw a conventional pork operation, right, and you said, you know what, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with how those animals are being raised. I am only going to eat wild pigs, I see. You see where I'm going with that? It's the response isn't a critical response. Hey, how can we work with the cycles and systems of nature to, to raise pigs better? Like, how can we figure this out? In the fish world, it's just interesting that it's like, well, I don't like fish farms. I'm just going to eat wild fish. And again, let me be clear. I feel like I got to be I got to have all these precursors. I am not anti wild caught fish at all. I do want to lay a little groundwork though. On when we say wild caught, like what does that even mean? In our mind, we have this picture of a guy on a boat with a fishing rod, and that's there couldn't be any further things. So, really quick, there are three types of, in, we're talking industrial scale wild fishing. Uh huh. The first, activity is called purse seining. You can look it up. So basically you have, now we're talking military technology being used to catch fish. Sonar, radar, helicopters. Helicopters will find schools of fish. You have speed boats that surround the school of fish with huge nets, right? And then you have other boats that pull these nets up and all, everything that is caught in that net dies. Sea turtles, anything, seals, any other types of fish that they're not even targeting, that can be up to 40% of just stuff in the net that just gets thrown back in the ocean because it wasn't targeted. Oh, wow. 
which that's bad. The second is long lining, which means there is a like multiple mile long cable with thousands of baited hooks on this line. It's left out there for a day or two and they reel in whatever's on the line. Again, there's no way to deter anything and everything. So they might throw away 40% of all those fish that were on those hooks because that wasn't the fish they were going for. I see. The last thing is like a, a deep water trawler, which is going to drop a big net to the bottom of the ocean and it's going to scrape up everything. It's like the equivalent of like slashing and burning in the Amazon. Yes. It's going to disturb the whole bottom again, pull all those fish up. So I just want to say when we say wild caught, we're talking about one of those three fishing practices. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we have idealized what it is. I did picture a man with a fishing rod and a line and he's pulling up a fish one by one. Who knows how long that would take him? And so there is kind of collateral damage, I guess I would say, for the marine life in the scenarios you're painting. But also let's talk about the issues with farmed fish before we get into the middle ground that you're describing okay. of doing it in a regenerative, sustainable way. So farmed fish is generally frowned upon as far as I understand it, because like concentrated animal feeding operations, the fish are kept in tight quarters. They don't see the sun. They're given dyes to make their flesh look more pink if it's salmon, for example, so that you think it's healthy. And of course, the fish get sick, so they probably give them antibiotics. It's all the same issues that we see with the land livestock. Is that right? Absolutely. It's all those things. It's, I mean, you described it. It's all those things. They're crowded, antibiotics in the feed. There's tons of issues. Yeah. Also, you know, we live in a society where, you know, we don't want the skin, we don't want the head, we don't want the tail, we don't want the bones. We just want our little boneless filet of fish. And (laughs) and no, 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 but here, but here, this is, this is amazing because the industry has pushed that. So if you have a fish that walked off the black pearl, half its face rotted off, its fins are all beat up. It's been packed in there with a bunch of fish. It's amazing because they've created a product where they, you don't know what that fish looked like. They just take a filet off and then serve it to you. And you can't look at that thing and know anything about oh, it. Oh, interesting. But that's it. That's so interesting because a healthy fish is going to look healthy. Uh-huh. Like, I mean, these, the outbreaks in, in the salmon world, I mean, these fish look beyond bad and they're still being eaten. And you go to the grocery store and you feel good that you got a nice piece of fish. Never mind that it's was disease ridden. Oh my goodness. Well, this is also the origin of baby carrots, as I understand it. Okay. <laughs> In other words, they didn't find the produce very appealing. I'm not saying it was really messed up, but so they were like, let's shave it down to these little bite-sized pieces that people might buy. So they were kind of trying to serve the public something that they are creating a demand for. You're right. I hadn't thought about it before. We don't get to see the whole fish. We just see a little filet. But so let's go now and talk about this third way. It's an option between the wild caught and the farm fish conditions that we were just describing that none of us want. What's the third way? I want to answer it. I want to get, let me say two other things real quick. I get it. The assumption behind wild caught fish is the fish are being raised in a clean environment, right? That's the assumption. Yes. Never mind. You know, in 25 years, there will be as much plastic in the ocean as there is fish, cumulatively, in weight. In 25 years, it'll be just as much plastic as fish? What? Yeah. Yeah. Hilda, listen to this. Listen to this. UC Davis did a study. They went up and down the coast of California, went to every fresh fish market, sampled all the fresh fish, right, that were coming in locally. They found microplastics in 25% of all the fish. That doesn't surprise me. So let me say it again. I'll say it a hundred times. I'm not anti-wild caught, but why am I going to pay whatever, $10, $12 a pound for ground beef from Polyface? Because there is a level of control that's going in to that product where you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is being raised correctly, Mm -hmm. right? So there's an element of control that you want as a consumer, Mm -hmm. but fish out in the ocean eating plastic, I mean, mercury coming from all the coal plants. I mean, all the recommendations about mercury levels in wild fish, there's plastic in 25% of it. I mean, look at the, the way it's farmed. It just, 
it's not as picturesque as because a lot of our pretense around the ocean is like a week long beach vacation or we go to a sunset at the beach. Like we're not, you can't go and visit. You can't get on board one of these fishing ships. So it's it's hard to really see like what really happens. And even in a wild caught scenario, domestically, you're going to have the fish is going to be put on a fishing vessel, right? The fish is then going to be gone to a primary processor at one facility. They're going to take the head off. They're going to gut it, right? That fish is going to go to another facility, a different facility where they're going to fillet the fish. And from there, it goes to another facility for distribution. And then from there, it goes to a grocery store. So even in a situation like that, it's still changing hands like five or six times the same product before it gets to the grocery store and you can go buy it and eat it. Yeah, gosh, I hadn't really thought about all these layers. And you're right. I think some of us are very careful about the source of our meat our red meat or our pork or our chicken on the table, but we hadn't thought about this fish bit because we've idealized, as I said earlier, the wild caught scenario. So I know, Ty, that you and Shannon have bought an antique hatchery. And apparently this has been around for a while. Talk to us about this third way, this kind of regenerative way of fish farming. So I operate a 1930s trout hatchery in Southwest Virginia, where we run our facility. There's a 3000 gallon a minute beautiful spring that's feeding our raceways and our ponds. It's amazing that, you know, the water there is, it's coming out of the ground at, you know, 52 degrees year round. It's a, it's a pH of an eight. Amazing. It's naturally alkaline. The key with fish farming is like with pork farming. What's the difference between a commodity pork operation and a polyface or a white oak pastures? Well, it's, it's night and day. Your polyface, white oak pastures, regenerative agriculture, land-based is trying to mimic natural systems, yep. natural environments. So we're doing the same thing in our hatchery. The fish are out in these cold water ponds, earthen ponds. There's vegetation. They're eating bugs in the evening. It's low densities. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship that a fish farm can have with the fish. Just like I'm trying to just paint pictures that are familiar for folks, Mm -hmm. you know, the pasture pork versus the commodity pork. And yeah, it's been amazing to see what we can do with aquaculture. I mean, to see that wild fish stocks are down 90%. I mean, they're talking about by 2050, the oceans, like, did you know that 90 million pounds, that's the haul every year from the ocean. Did you know that that number is stabilized and even started declining since 2002? The demand for seafood in terms of what the population is doing over time, like, the demand outstrips the supply 10 to 1. And here we are in the fourth quarter of it all and nobody's saying anything. And Yeah, I have heard about overfishing, mm-hmm. but I didn't really, I hadn't wrapped my head around the concept. Basically, what you're saying is we're extracting more from the ocean than it can even keep up with. Right. You know, farmed fish is now half of the whole seafood industry. And it's really interesting that the roots of aquaculture, the first kind of primarily farm salmon businesses that were getting off the ground took funding from big ag. So big ag kind of inserted there the mindset, the ethos of this sort of monocultured, high density thought processes to raising fish. That is why Fish farming does not have a good name. Wow. And that's why, and then it's really amazing. I mean, there's operations all over the world that have really, really consciously crafted structures and systems in place to mimic the natural environment to raise healthy, amazing fish that don't have plastics, that don't have mercury, that don't have all this stuff that a potential wild fish could have. And what's so cool, Ty, is that, for example, where you're doing it with your fish, it's a natural environment. I've actually been to your hatchery and I saw 
the clean water coming down the mountainside and, and springing up on your property. And so you don't have them in some artificial tanks. I guess I just always assumed it was farm fish or wild caught and that was it. I never realized there were more possibilities and that, of course, that what we're doing in a regenerative sense for the land, we could do for the fish. And I mean, for the livestock, we could also do in a regenerative way for the fish. A hundred percent. We sell our fish through Polyface and White Oak Pastures and our own website. And, you know, in the past two years, we've gotten into, you know, some Michelin star restaurants. And it's amazing to see regenerative aquaculture kind of like come on the scene like regenerative agriculture has in the past 15 years. Ty, can you tell us more about the process, like from start to finish? So we hatch fish from eggs there on the property. Yeah, so it's about a 14-month process where raising the fish from eggs. It's really amazing that we get to, we start the eggs once they've hatched, we start the eggs on a minced grass-fed beef liver, which is amazing. Obviously, liver, one of the most nutrient-dense substances on the planet. It's amazing that back in the 1930s, during when I, the era when our hatchery was built, they fed organ meats. That was the primary food they used for the fish. How do you know? Because, I mean, I've eat, slept, breed this thing for the past however long I've been here. But it's amazing because even in all the books from the 1930s, the recommended feed was ground organ meats. And they actually fed roadkill to the trout back in the 1930s as well. Arguably a very clean feed. But it, it's just cool that we were doing it right like a hundred years ago and it just got all screwed up and here we are trying to go backwards to go forwards. Coming up, Ty tells us what we can do as consumers to support regenerative aquaculture and why salmon is the fish you see the most often on restaurant menus. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. One Earth Health. Explore the amazing benefits of organ meats with One Earth Health. Did you know that organ meats from New Zealand are 400% more packed with nutrients compared to those from other countries? That means you get a lot more vitamin A, K, and the B complex, plus other high-quality nutrients. At One Earth Health, they put these nutrients into easy-to-take capsules. Their cows are raised in pastures without GMOs or pesticides. And what's special about their capsules? At One Earth Health, they are filler-free, just pure, 100% organ meat. And their prices are the best for organs from New Zealand. You can get their popular beef organ supplement bottle for just $39.99. And it comes with 200 capsules. So boost your nutrition with One Earth Health now. Go to their website, oneearthhealth.com slash wise traditions for a special sign-up page that gives you a 15% discount. That's oneearthhealth.com slash wise traditions for a special sign-up page that gives you a 15% discount. And Optimal Carnivore. Brain Nourish is a revolutionary new product from the guys over at Optimal Carnivore. They have combined grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushrooms in a groundbreaking formula. It is the ultimate whole food, no tropic to build a better brain. Now available for the first time together in convenient capsules. Studies have shown that both ingredients are remarkable for improving focus, boosting mood, improving memory, giving you greater clarity and enhanced creativity, and so many more benefits for health, vitality, and longevity. Each serving of the Brain Nourish has 1,500 milligrams of organic lion's mane and 1,500 milligrams of beef brain. They only use 100% real mushrooms, organic fruiting bodies, which are rigorously tested for active compounds. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code Weston10 to get 10% off your order. Yes, Optimal Carnivore has Brain Nourish, their grass-fed organ complex, grass-fed liver, and more. Again, go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code Weston10 for 10% off all products. This is Hoda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Talk to us more about the process. So you get them as eggs. They grow up like at what time do you harvest the fish to sell them at restaurants and markets and so forth? Yeah. So we have like a hatchery building where we hatch the fish and it's inside, obviously the little fry, what you call them, or, you know, they're very fragile. They need sort of like a controlled sort of environment. So once they leave there, 
they go to a couple, we have a couple like concrete, they're called raceways. The water's about three feet deep. It's maybe about a hundred gallons a minute. And then once they get big enough that every bird and frog in the world could eat them, they go into like earthen ponds, which is a, a packed, like a, a rock bottom. There's all kinds of grasses and moss. And it's amazing that, you know, I'm a big fly fisherman and in the fly fisherman world, you know, hatches coming off in the evening, all the bugs. It's amazing to see that in our ponds. Yeah. So it takes about 14 months. So we take care of these fish for about 14 months. Mm. Then we uh, process the fish. We have a little facility right down the road from our farm. And from there, it gets shipped all over. This doesn't mean just because this is the regenerative way in which to raise these fish, this doesn't mean it's easy. I think I saw a post of your alls on Instagram where there was some tragedy and you lost a lot of fish. What happened? Yeah, that was last summer. It was just, we had a pipe move. This was at a different facility, like down the road that we were kind of trying out. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things. It's, yeah, for an animal, they're able to breathe air at all times, even if they don't have something to drink or something to eat. With a fish, the dissolved oxygen in the water is their air. Mm -hmm. So if there's an issue with that, then the fish aren't going to make it. So it's been a major learning curve, but we're super committed. I mean, to be able to stand behind a product that I personally have taken care of for 14 months and, you know, it gets served on a plate at a restaurant or somebody orders one of our trout boxes. And it's like, how many places... Okay. From a fish at a grocery store, how many places can you say, I can go visit the address and see the fish alive in the water? How many? I mean, I can't even count them on one hand. Well, I'm just saying like, I mean, our address is on our website. So for me and my kids, it's amazing to be like, Dude, I don't have to guess about where my seafood's coming from or like, is there mercury in it? Is there plastics in it? Did eight dolphins have to die to get like, I literally can go and see the fish. I know exactly what I'm getting. I know their life cycle. And I get to be a part of a seafood that I can really, truly stand behind. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of assuming, but I have to ask, you don't give your fish antibiotics or any dyes or anything? No, no. So don't, we don't do any of that. We don't need to. It's like grass-based agriculture. It's all, and that was our background, you know, grass-fed Wagyu beef and pasture pork. If you do things right from the start, you're going to be in the preventative side, not the allopathic treat symptom side. And it's amazing, like, you know, if if like, and I just did a video on this, like the spring, you know, like we'll have like a spring flood once or twice a year and it kicks up a bunch of silt. That'll irritate like the fish's gills. They may have some gill issues. We just put salt in the water and it decreases inflammation like in their gills Ah. and then if they do have something internal that's going on you know we soak the feed in iodine and feed that to the fish so just like any other medicine you can go to walgreens every five minutes and get all doped up or you can try a more holistic natural approach so it's been amazing to kind of take the mindsets that we learned with doing our other kind of farming operations, obviously different skills, but same mindset kind of into the aquaculture space. Now I have a question. As a consumer, how can I make more sustainable choices? You were talking earlier about how the big operations will discard the head and the bones. How can I learn to eat the whole fish? My mom didn't teach me that. Yeah. My mom didn't teach me either. She did teach me many things. So thank you, mom. But (laughs) whole fish is far, uh, like, dude, there's this amazing farm in, in Greece. I forget the name. It's these beautiful uh, bronzinos that are in these, like, estuaries, and it's this amazing system. Anyway, I can't remember the name. But whole fish is going to show you with your eyes. This fish lived a pretty, pretty good life. It looks intact. The fins are intact. The eyes are clear. The nose isn't rubbed off. That's, that's a big one. We only do whole fish. Mm. that's because i mean and then once you eat the fish it's amazing you can do like a fish stock cook something else in it there's so many different uses i mean plus there's so much good like fat and meat like around the fish collars and the head and 
you know, it's it's like nose to tail, but a fish, you know. So yeah. whole, I would say number one, whole fish for sure. Mm hmm. And I do know Sally has resources too, if not in her book, Nourishing Traditions, definitely on the WestonAPrice.org website. I've seen her make fish stock before, so I know yeah. there's lots of goodness in there for sure. But I have another question for you. Ty, yeah. why don't I ever see trout on a menu? Like when I go to restaurants, it's usually salmon or swordfish or tuna or something. So there's so much to unpack there. With salmon, that is the most heavily funded species in the whole world, salmon. Wow. I was at the Boston Seafood Show a month ago, and the amount of money in the... Because salmon was the first domesticated fish, as far as the breeding, getting the size right. I mean, cows have been, you know, domesticated for thousands of years or whatever. You know, aquaculture isn't new, but as far as domesticating and inline breeding enough to get a salmon to look the same way, you know, with every generation, that's the narrative, man. To be honest, that's the narrative. And that's, they've gotten that thing so dialed in with the salmon farms and even, I mean, wild caught salmon, just me personally, like in our lifetime, I mean, we will see the collapse of the wild Sand. I mean, the East Coast runs have been gone for a long time. The West Coast runs are done. I mean, just in the past year, three of the biggest wild caught salmon processing facilities in Alaska have closed because the runs are, they're gone. And then to still keeping to champion wild caught, it's like in a perfect world, sure, but we're not in a perfect world. I mean, if we said, hey, every, I mean, look what, look what happened to the American bison. Mm -hmm. as a wild food, utterly decimated. Absolutely. So, but if I was like wild bison, Hilda, <laughs> you'd be like, well, Ty, is that really like the best decision? Like, I understand it's healthy, but is that the best decision like for our environment and for the longevity of us being stewards on this earth? Uh, the answer would be no. So I'm just, again, I don't have some big agenda. I'm just a dude that has a trout farm. I'm just <laughs> trying to paint a picture and obviously all the wild caught fish industry of course they don't want to tell you about regenerative aquaculture they're like keep buying that keep buying that wild caught salmon and we're just gonna milk every last salmon off the face of it it's like the lorax oh my god you know yes totally i mean i'm not trying to be more but i'm literally just trying to present the case of what's going on and regenerative aquaculture is a way to have a beautiful, healthy, clean product that you don't have to wonder. I mean, if I just turned pigs out and was like, I'm going to harvest them in a year. And I was like, well, they're wild raised. Well, you don't know. Did that thing get in a landfill? Was it, I mean, you don't know what the thing ate or didn't ate. But in the regenerative agriculture space, we pride ourselves on knowing how did the animal live? What was it fed? What's going on with it? I want to go see him. Like, why don't we do that same thing with aquaculture? I want to see the fish in the water. That should be what we're saying. So are there salmon farms like your trout farm that are using these regenerative aquaculture techniques? Because that would be a nice in between too, but I haven't heard of it. It would. I can't definitively answer that question because I'm not going to answer that question. And I've, unless I, me personally have been to the place, mm. I don't care what's on their website. I don't care what the pictures are. I want to go and see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody can put in, you could say, I mean, even with fresh and frozen, you know, there's no regulations around labels of fresh. Some can be in the grocery store as fresh and it could have been thawed out. They could thaw it. There's no regulatory thing around fresh or frozen. I'm saying- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that that area in the grocery store where all the little fish on ice and you think they just caught them and they were never frozen, there's no promise that that's true? No, Hilda, the word fresh means not frozen. It doesn't mean it got caught yesterday. Oh, no. So I'm just saying if you as a consumer want to go in there and just roll the dice- Go roll the dice. But for me, again, I've eat, sleep, breathe this whole thing for years. So having my, I guess, perspective, I'm like, man, I don't care if I just eat trout forever. I want to know that I know that I know because that's the way I am with bacon or pork chops right. or steaks. 
I want to know that I know that I know. Well, I want to know that I know that I know for fish. For those of us who still enjoy fish, would you say that the benefits of the fish outweigh the mercury and microplastics that might be found in them? I'm talking about if I buy wild caught from my local store and I'm like, okay, that's as good as I can do right now because I'm not near Ty's fish farm that's doing it all right. Would the benefits of the fish be better than avoiding seafood altogether? Just tell me your opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, me personally, like, I don't want microplastics and mercury. Like, that's going to be a tough. I mean, I've got a, I got a six-year-old and be like, I think it may have mercury, but, (laughs) you know, it's like fit, you know, but you'll be fine. I don't know. So, but that being said, omega-3s only come from green material that the fish have consumed. Like, we all do omega-3s, omega-3s. That's all that's great, but that's not naturally occurring in the fish. That's going to be indicative of the environment. So, based on what the fish or didn't eat, it gets really nuanced. To have the variable of you don't know where the fish came from, you don't know how fresh it is, you don't know if it's been frozen, you don't know what's in it, like, I don't know. It's tough. And I'm not trying to turn everybody off. I'm just presenting, like... It's like the Wild West, and it's been amazing for us to, you know, we ship nationwide, and it's been amazing to get emails and messages of people that are like, man, I've been looking for so long that something that a seafood option that is totally transparent with what they're doing and how they're doing it. And in our instances, a freshwater fish is 80% water, so water quality is of utmost importance. I mean, and to answer your question, I mean, that's... I don't know. (laughs) Well, you know what you would do for yourself and your family, but you live at the hatchery with the trout that you're raising yourself. So you know the quality of that. The rest of us are sometimes just trying to do the best we can. And I guess it's a decision we each have to make for ourselves. But you have gone far to inform us. And Ty, this is important because some people say, oh, some of the podcasts are scaring us or, you know, but we're just putting the information out and then the people decide for themselves what they're going to do with it. And this is not to scare anybody. I mean, there's a bunch of regenerative aquaculture farms out there. And like you order, you order your meat from Polyface or White Oak Pastures or whatever. You can order trout from us. You can order fish that is raised correctly. It's out there. So I want to back up as we prepare to close, Ty. I want you to tell us what got you into this in the first place? You said you're, you didn't know anything about fish, I don't think, before you guys got the hatchery. What's your personal background? It was like a total God thing. I mean, we were, my grandparents' farm, that's where our name comes from, Smoking Chimneys. Yeah, we had, we're doing like the grass-fed Wagyu beef thing, pasture pork. My wife has a raw milk herd share. Before that, we were farming in Oregon. So this opportunity came up with this trout hatchery, and we were just kind of at a place like, we just felt like, I think this is for us. It was like a major, major leap of faith. It took like two years just to get the place like off the ground. And then like we're the only trout processor in the state of Virginia, which is insane to even say. But that took a year of going back and forth with the regulations and being able to process the fish. And it's been a major journey. But yeah, this is our fifth year. This is our third year actually with like a product to market. So It's been a ride. And on the most difficult days, what keeps you going? I mean, to be totally honest, I'm so like just deep into this thing with our time and energy and resources. And it's like, we just got to keep going. And it's like, where is it going to end up? And it's like, well, I don't know. You know, it's it's amazing. We started carbonating our spring water. So we're doing that. We're working on uh, doing like a 10 fish is huge right now, like a 10 trout so yeah i got a bunch of cool products and just the wins of like i mean to to be able to work with dan barber i mean that's amazing sending brook trout up there and places up and down the east coast and it's just been amazing just to see the response from people that just see the value of regenerative aquaculture systems and how that we believe is the future Yeah, that is powerful. That would keep me going too. All right. So now I want to pose to you, Ty, the question I love to pose at the end of the program. This is health related, not necessarily fish related. Yeah. But if the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? For me, and I would say, I mean, I've been on gaps, intro to gap. We've done all the stuff and it's, it's all amazing. But 
I think managing stress and getting rid of stress, I think that's something to, to hang your hat on. Beyond the food and, and whatever, it's the lifestyle of just an inner like peace. I think that attributes more than we think to the longevity of a person's life. That's right. The longevity and probably the health span. In other words, not just living a long time, but living a healthy life your whole life. Right. So that's amazing. Ty, thank you. Thank you for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Hilda. Our guest today was Ty Walker. Visit his website, smokeinchimneys.com to learn more. And I am Hilda Labrada gore the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent letter to the editor from our Spring 2024 Wise Traditions Journal. Thank you from Western Australia. It's a hot summer morning in the outskirts of Perth when I check my bushfire app. Unnecessary evil when your state has constant bushfires for about five months of the year. I jump in my car with my esky cooler full of ice and head out for a long drive to my local farmer where I can get delicious raw milk and cream. But I'm okay with that. Thank you, Weston A. Price Foundation and Natasha Campbell McBride. Here in Perth, the number of WAPF members is probably less than 100. On your podcast, Hilda's Voice encourages me as I get further out of the city. Side note, I'm happy to hear this. Raw cow's milk is illegal here, not just in Western Australia, but the whole country. But I don't care. I have faith in the Weston A. Price Foundation and the GAPS diet. They didn't poison me with amalgams and root canals and toxic food and water. My list of health problems is long, like many others in modern society. And as with many of us who discover WAPF, my husband is not entirely on board. When people don't understand or judge me, or even get angry at me, I am reminded of how Weston Price lost his son, and that sometimes learning can stem from a painful or scary experience, that learning is valuable and can change our lives in ways we could have never imagined. One day, my husband said something to the effect of, people don't know what you're talking about. It's crazy talk. They don't have time for this stuff. I remember my response vividly. That's because they're not sick enough yet. Sadly, I believe that. I try to believe that little things matter and tell people around me what I know if they are open to hearing it. And I try to keep Hilda's motto in mind, keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. A big thank you to everyone involved with WAPF, name withheld. This warms my heart to know that people on the other side of the planet are listening to these words and feeling and finding encouragement. That is our mission here at the Weston A. Price Foundation. Education, research, and activism. We do it for you. We join hands with you on your journey. And thank you so much for listening, my friend. Stay well and do remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.